Hey, good evening, everybody. Pastor Mike, His Grace Church, right here in beautiful San Antonio, Texas. Man, we're touching lives and we're changing hearts. His Grace Church, a destination for divine visitation where miracles are still happening today. Man, I want to take this opportunity to welcome you to Amplify Amplifies, our midweek Bible study, man. Amplifies where we're turning up the heat every Thursday night with practical teaching for everyday living. We hear it, we see it in the Word of God, and then we live it together as a community of believers. So in just a few moments, we're going to get right into the Word of God. and then. But before we do this, just open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we just come before you this evening, and we thank you for your precious, holy, written Word. We thank you for the, the truth of the Word, the power of the Word, the life-changing transformation that's available within and through your Word. We thank you this evening for the Holy Spirit as well, who is our teacher, our guide, and our comforter. And we just ask you, Holy Spirit, to guide us into the truth, to teach through us, to reveal uh, your, the, the, the written and the spoken word this evening. And so we thank you for these things. And as we do, we thank you for the anointing that's upon the word, which will break the yoke of bondage in every area of life of our study tonight. In Jesus' name, amen have a lot of ground to cover, so we're going to just get going. Amen? So we're going to be looking tonight, we're back to um, The Good Life, Part 5, and we're going to be looking at Pathways to Prosperity this evening. And I've subtitled this, The Hard Worker's Journey versus Fantasy's Pitfall. I know it's a lot of a lot of words, but the hard worker's journey versus fantasy's pitfall. And so in our last lesson, we began to look at uh, Psalms chapter 34 and verse 10. And if you, re if you recall, the scripture tells us that even strong lions sometimes go hungry. But those who trust in the Lord will lack no good thing. So through this lesson last week, we found how important navigating trust is is to living a prosperous life in God. And so tonight, we're going to begin to look at some of the causes of poverty. We're not going to get through the whole list, and we're not going to finish it, but we're going to begin looking at some of the causes of lack and poverty. And so beginning in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 through 11, and I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation tonight, is to take a lesson from the ants. Solomon is writing uh, the proverb. He says, take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Learn from their ways and become wise. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summer gathering food for the winter. But you lazy bones, how long will you sleep? When will you wake up? A little sleep? A little more slumber? A little folding of the hands to rest? Then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. So these passages here in Proverbs convey a lesson about the importance of what? Diligence and hard work. And in this context, we see that the cause of poverty is presented as laziness, lack of initiative, and neglecting one's responsibility. And the comparison with ants then is used to highlight the industrious and diligent nature of these creatures who work hard during the summer to prepare for the winter when there is no harvest available. The warning in this passage, however, suggests that those who choose to be lazy, constantly seeking more sleep and rest, without attending to their responsibilities are at risk of what? Facing poverty and scarcity. So the image of poverty, pouncing like a bandit or scarcity attacking like an armed robber emphasizes this point that the sudden and harsh consequences of neglecting your duties, that these are the Sudden and hard, harsh consequences of neglecting your duties. And these verses within the wisdom literature of Proverbs are intended to encourage, number one, strong work ethic. Number two, responsible behavior. Responsible behavior for what? 
responsible behavior to avoid the negative consequences associated with laziness. So, there are six points, if we look in this pas these passages of Scripture, that we can take away uh, from the ants. And the passage here in Proverbs chapter 6, 6 through 11, again uses the ant to impart several lessons about diligence, responsibility, and the consequences of laziness. And so, here are six key points that we can learn from the ant. Number one, industrious and planning. Ants work hard during the summer gathering food for the winter. So they are, they are in preparation. This, this emphasizes the importance of planning for the future and then being industrious in our efforts. So they're planners. Number two, the second lesson that we can take away from the ants in this story is self-motivation. Ants don't have a leader forcing them to work. They are self-motivated. What does this teach us? This teaches us the value of underlying motivation and taking personal responsibility for our own task. The third thing that we can take away from the ants within this lesson is consistency. Ants consistently labor to gather food. This particular passage of Scripture encourages us to adopt a consistent and disciplined approach in our work and in within our responsibilities. The fourth thing we can take away from the ants in this passage of Scripture is ants is preparation. Ants prepare for the future by storing food. This highlights the importance of being prepared and making provision for potential challenges and hardships. Number five, the fifth point that we can take away from the ants is warning against laziness. This passage uses the term lazy bones and warns against excessive sleep and rest. It doesn't warn against sleep or rest, excessive sleep and rest. And it suggests that laziness and neglecting your responsibilities can lead to negative consequences, consequences such as poverty and lack. And the final thing that we, the final uh, example or the lesson that we could take away from the ants within this passage of scripture is the urgency in action, which the vivid imagery of poverty pouncing like a bandit emphasizes the urgency of taking action and not delaying or procrastinating in our responsibilities. So, let's summarize this. The ant serves as a model for diligence, self-motivation, consistency, and preparation. And this passage of Scripture in Proverbs then encourages us to, to adapt these qualities to lead a responsible and fruitful life. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 15 tells us, The wealth of the rich is their fortress. The poverty of the poor is their destruction. What we see here in Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 15, it suggests that the wealth of the rich serves as a form of protection, or we could say security, acting like a fortress that shields them from various challenges in life. On the other hand, the poverty of the poor is described as their destruction, indicating that financial hardships can make individuals more vulnerable to difficulties and struggles. And this could also highlight the need for compassion, empathy, and kindness towards those facing economic challenges that are within our community, within our families, or that are part of our immediate surroundings. So it, this passage then could also serve as a reminder that material wealth should not be the sole measure of a person's worth and that caring for the less fortunate is an integral part of living out our faith. Now, let me ask you a question. Within this passage of Scripture, do we see God 
as a destroyer. No, we do not, right? Remember several weeks ago we looked at the Scripture, John 10, verse 10, and we found two job descriptions. Satan's job, we defined it as to what? To, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And Jesus said his job, his purpose, is, was to bring and is to bring a rich and satisfying life. And within that study, we identified who the destroyer really was based on that passage of Scripture. But the question is, what destroys the poor? What destroys the poor? Well, this passage indicates that it is the culprit is poverty, right? But then if it's poverty, how would we define poverty? Well, thank you for asking tonight. Poverty is commonly defined as a state or condition in which an individual or community lacks the financial resources and essential means for a basic standard of living, including but not limited to access to necessities such as food, shelter, clothing, and health care. Now, poverty often involves a, an insufficient income to meet the basic needs, and it can manifest in various forms, such as absolute poverty, meaning the lacking of the essentials just to, for survival, or relative po po poverty, meaning that we fall below the average standard of living in a given society. But when we look at poverty, we have to understand that poverty is multidimensional and that it encompasses economic, social, and even cultural factors, and it can also have a profound effect on overall well-being, what well, we said, that our overall well-being as an individual, along with the opportunities for those of us who are experiencing it. If poverty can bring destruction, then we have to find out what is the cause of poverty. And so one of the root causes of poverty in society, from my point of view, is, a co is complex and multifaceted and can vary across different regions and contexts. And so when we look at root causes of poverty in society, we see again that they're complex, multifaceted, and then they can, they can vary across different regions or different parts of the country, different parts of the world uh, in context. So, however, though, some common factors contribute to the persistence of poverty, and this may include, may, it may include in our day-to-day -day lives and we're going to look at, I think, seven possible, eight possible scenarios that could consist to cause poverty in our own lives. And so here's eight reasons. Number one, economic in, in equality, inequality, meaning unequal distribution of wealth and resources which then can lead to a lack of opportunities and access to essential goods and services for certain segments of the population. So, common factors that, that could contribute to the persistence of poverty in our lives. Number two, lack of education. Allowing limited access to quality education can extend cycles of poverty by restricting individuals from acquiring the skills and knowledge necessary and needed for better employment opportunities. Number three, unemployment and underemployment, meaning lack of job opportunities or low-paying jobs can contribute to poverty as individuals struggle to meet their basic needs with this insufficient income. Then we have number four, which would be health issues. Poor health, exasperated by inadequate health care access, can lead to increased medical expenses and reduced productivity, 
contributing to poverty as well. Number five, we would, we would say discrimination and social injustice, meaning that sy systematic discrimination based on factors such as gender, race, ethnicity, or social class can also limit opportunities and perpetuate poverty for marginalized groups. We're looking at reasons, common factors and reasons that can contribute to poverty. Poverty. Number six, then, would be political instability and corruption. Societies experiencing political instability or high levels of corruption may struggle to establish and maintain effective governance systems, hindering economic development and poverty reduction uh, efforts. Now, good examples of that might be Cuba. You know, back in the 50s, Cuba was a very rich and prosperous country until Fidel Castro took over and it became a dictatorship. Venezuela used to produce one of the rich, it used to be one of the richest nations um, on the earth due to the oil production. And we see how ineffective governing systems have hindered the economic development and helped proliferate poverty in Venezuela. The stories that come out of there where they don't even have, they, they don't even have the simple necessities of life, and yet they've gone from the richest to one of the poorest nations in the world because of the political instability and corruption that goes on there. Number seven would be environmental factors. Environment, environmental issues such as natural disasters, climate change per se, or resource depletion can disproportionately impact vulnerable communities and then by doing so contribute to poverty. Number eight would be family structure and dynamics. Single parent households or families with large numbers of dependents may face increased financial strain, making it a challenge then to escape poverty. I know when I was growing up, uh, my parents fit in a lot of these dynamics. They were uneducated, they were of a lower class uh, financially, they had four kids, um, and so we went without quite extensively, you know, and so they had lack of education. They were either unemployed or underemployed because of their education. Um, but when, again, we come back to the family structure and dynamics, even though we were not a single parent household, uh, it took both of my parents to work to support us four growing kids. And it was always a financial strain on my parents, per, thus making it challenging for them to escape poverty. And for years, uh, my parents were under the barrel. I mean, and so when we look at these factors, it's important to note that these factors often interact and reinforce one another by creating complex webs of challenges we'll say it like this, a complex web of challenges for individuals within communities, creating a more, more likelihood for poverty in their lives. And addressing poverty typically requires comprehensive and coordinated efforts on economic, social, uh, and political fronts, as well as spiritual. Um, so, when we look at this naturally, we can see just in our own communities how poverty has sunk its teeth through some of these dynamics and reasons that we've just talked about. However, can we address this spiritually? Or do we have to address it socially, economically, and as a community? Or can we address this spiritually as well? Is poverty a spiritual thing or just an economic, social thing? I think we can address it spiritually. And I'll tell you why. Because Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24 gives us some good advice. Notice what Solomon said. Give freely 
and become more wealthy, be stingy and lose everything. Notice that this is a kingdom concept. Generosity is God's strategy to alleviate poverty. So, what did he say? Share freely and you'll experience increased prosperity. This statement suggests a belief that practicing generosity or freely giving to others is viewed as a strategy in alignment with divine principles to reduce or alleviate poverty. The idea is that by sharing your resources, whether it be time, money, or other forms of assistance, individuals such as yourself then are participating in the virtuous and God-ordained act of giving. Basically, the statement, the statement suggests that being generous or sharing with others is a good thing. Generosity is God's strategy to alleviate poverty. It's just not about helping them. It can also bring good things back to you. So, what would be the result or the benefit then of giving? For the person who gives generously, the Bible suggests that beyond helping others, there can be positive outcomes for the givers as well. The act of sharing is seen as a two-way street. By giving to others, individuals may also experience personal benefits. And this concept then emphasizes a link between giving and receiving, especially within a broader framework. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 18 says this, If you ignore criticism, you will end in poverty and disgrace. If you accept correction, you'll be honored. Now, according to this statement, one cause of poverty is what? Ignoring criticism. And the idea that if someone dismisses or does not heed constructive criticism, it may lead to negative consequences such as poverty and disgrace. But on the, on the contrary, though, this verse suggests that accepting correction can lead to honor, implying that being open to feedback and making necessary adjustments can contribute to a more positive outcome in life. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 21. I'm going to read this from the Amplified. For the heavy drinker and the glutton will, will come to poverty, and the drowsiness of overindulgence will clothe one with rags. So according to this statement, three behaviors that can lead to poverty are this. Number one, heavy drinking, meaning excessive alcohol consumption is mentioned <clears throat> as a factor that may lead to poverty. Excessive alcohol consumption often leads to poor decision makings, impaired judgment, and health issues. The first thing that you learn about alcohol in any type of alcohol-related training is the first thing to go when you have alcohol on board is judgment. Sound judgment goes out. And so this leads then to poor decision making and Excessive alcohol can lead to health issues. And these consequences then can contribute to a downward spiral affecting your ability to maintain employment, manage your finances, uh, make responsible life choices, which can all ultimately lead to uh, poverty. So number two that was mentioned in, in Proverbs chapter 21, 23, 21, is gluttony. Hmm. We all want to talk about people who overindulge in alcohol, but let's talk about people who overindulge in food. It's called being a glutton. And a glutton is identified as another behavior that can contribute to the state of impoverishment or poverty. Overindulging in food may lead to health problems, including obesity and other related issues. And health complications can result in increased medical expenses, Reduce productivity, which then impacts your ability to work and to maintain financial stability, thus ultimately contributing to a state of impoverishment or poverty. Overeating, isn't that amazing? 
What happens when you overeat? No, leads us to point number three, drowsiness from overindulgence. Now, the statement then suggests that being excessively drowsy or lethargic, lethargic due to overindulgence, which may include both drinking and gluttony, can result in poverty and destitution. And so being ex excessively drowsy or lethargic, possibly due to overindulgence in both either drinking or eating, which is considered gluttony, can negatively affect your productivity and your work performance. How many have ever had a nice big fat meal at lunch and then decided, I got to go back to work, but man, I really would like to take a nap, right? I was just listening to, um, just listening to, uh, as I'm, I'm doing a study and I was listening to this book online and this, this particular doctor who's a PhD said that between, you have lunch between, but between 1 and 2.30, you have this dip where you, the body wants to become non-productive. So when we look then at overindulgence, it can affect our pro productivity and work performance. And this particular diminished ability to fulfill our responsibilities then can lead to financial instability. It can lead to job loss. And consequently, it will lead us into poverty. And so when we look at these three, um, three behaviors that can lead us to poverty, here that are mentioned, heavy drinking, gluttony, drowsiness from overindulgence, um, we, we can see they are detrimental to physical health. We can see that they're detrimental to our mental acuity and overall life functioning, which collectively can contribute to the risk of falling into poverty as well. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 30 says this, I walk by the field of a lazy person in the vineyard of one of the, I walk by the field of a lazy person, the vineyard of one with no common sense. And I saw that it was overgrown with nettles and it was covered with weeds and its walls were broken down. Then I looked and I thought about it and I learned this lesson. A little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. Again, in this passage of Scripture, the cause of poverty is attributed to two things, laziness and a lack of diligence. The field and the vineyard mentioned are described as neglected, overgrown with nettles, covered with weeds, and broken down walls. And the thought is that the owner of the field is not putting in the necessary effort to maintain and cultivate this particular field. And when we look at this passage of Scripture, it suggests that the person's laziness, symbolized by the little extra sleep and a folding of the hands to rest, led to the state of disrepair and poverty of this field. And then the imagery of poverty pouncing like a bandit and scarcity attacking like an armed robber reinforces and emphasizes the sudden and harsh consequences of neglecting our responsibilities and then becoming complacent. Within our, our work ethic, well, that's going, to, I'm moving too far ahead. So when we look at this particular passage of Scripture, within this person's work ethic, there are missing elements which might include diligence, responsibility, and a proactive approach maintaining the field in the vineyard. The description implies a lack of common sense as the field is neglected, overgrown with nettles, covered with weeds, and has broken down walls. And the owner of the field, this individual, seems to be failing in the task related to cultivation and maintenance, indicating a lack of care and attention to their responsibilities. This phrase, a little extra sleep, along with a little more slumber, and a little of the folding of the hands to rest suggests a tendency towards laziness and a lack of industriousness. And when we look at the consequence that is mentioned, such as poverty and scarcity, 
we have to highlight the direct correlation between the person's deficient work ethic and the adverse outcomes in their livelihood. So then let me ask you a question. How important is our work ethic? This scripture highlights the direct link between a proactive and diligent approach to work with and, and the avoidance of adverse circumstances. So if you have a good work ethic and you're proactive, you have a diligent approach, you're not going to have the adverse reactions that we read about in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 34, where it says, And poverty will pounce on you like a bandit, and scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. This scripture then underscores the critical importance of a strong work ethic. You know, when I was growing up, that was something you learned early, especially growing up in the country, you learned a strong work ethic. Even in the city, we were working when, I, I don't know about, about you, but by the time I was 13, I was throwing papers. That was back when we had newspapers. We were throwing papers. That, and that was before, you know, the 45 and 50-year-old people would throw, we would, we'd throw them after school. We'd throw them, we'd have to get up and, and, because it was an evening paper, you'd have, they, they'd send it to you in a bundle. You'd have to wrap it up in a, fold it up, however, put a rubber band around it, and then trudge through, you know, 10 inches of snow for 50 miles, throwing papers, right? By the time I was 16, I was working in a fast food restaurant. By the time I was 18, I was working in a in a factory, and you know, in all my life, except for very short times, I was always working. And when I went to work, I wasn't a slacker. I worked. I was always promoted. I was always given raise. Why? Because my parents instilled a great work ethic. I wasn't expecting something from the employer except to be paid for the work I did. I wasn't expecting to be made manager in a week. I wasn't expecting to sit around and tell people what to do when I had no education. We worked, and we were rewarded for our work. And so having a good work ethic is something that you may not have today, but you can get. And so, again, this scripture underscores the critical importance of, then of having a strong work ethic, but it also encourages us as individuals to cultivate to cultivate a robust work ethic and to safeguard against the potential negative impacts that could occur on our livelihood and well-being. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 19. A hard worker has plenty of food. Isn't that good? But a person who chases fantasies ends up in poverty. So in this verse, a hard worker is identified as a type of person who shall have plenty. And the emphasis is on diligence, again, industrialness, and a strong work ethic. And the person who puts in effort and works hard is described as having an abundance of food, suggesting that their dedication to labor then leads to prosperity and provision. But on the other hand, a person who chases fantasies, a, ch a person who chases fantasies, implying someone who is then impractical, might lack focus or engages in unrealistic pursuits, is contrasted with the hard worker and it then is said to end up in poverty. And this verse underscores in the value of diligence and practical work as a means to achieve abundance and then to avoid poverty and impoverishment. So, looking at, you know, uh, a person who is a fantasizer at work, what would that look like? What might a, a chaser of fantasies look like in today's society? Have you ever wondered that? Am I a chaser of fantasies? We're talking uh, in work-related a person who chases fantasies may engage in pursuits that are unrealistic, impractical, 
or even detached from reality. Let me give you a few examples of what I would, might consider uh, a chaser of fantasies today. Number one, a constant daydreamer. An example of a constant daydreamer might be uh, someone who spends a significant portion of their day lost in elaborate fantasies, imagining, imaginations, imaginating scenarios that are unlikely to happen and often neglecting then their real life responsibilities because they're off imagining all the stuff that might happen. It's like I might win the lottery. What would I do with the lottery? Why well, I've laid in bed. I've spent a couple million just laying in bed on my way to sleep. Amen. That's the fantasy. I like it to be a reality, but if I, if I think about that long enough and then I begin to act on that fantasy, I could begin to neglect my, my responsibilities because, you know, I'm going to win the lottery and I'll have money to do whatever I want. So now, as an example, imagine a person who constantly envisions himself as uh, uh, maybe ach achieving great success without putting in the necessary effort or planning. <laughs> Sounds like a lot of generation today, doesn't it? Without putting in the uh, effort of planning. They may dream about becoming a famous author without dedicating maybe time to write. They might fantasize about winning the lottery as a primary strategy for financial security rather than pursuing realistic financial planning and, and, or career development. I'm just going to lay around because I'm going to win the lottery. The this, <laughs> this constant daydreamer tends to prioritize their imaginative scenarios over practical actions leading to for a potential disconnect between their aspirations and the steps needed to turn those dreams into reality. Number two might be a get-rich schemer. An example of a get-rich schemer could be someone who frequently falls for or actively promotes schemes promising rapid and substantial financial gain with minimal effort or, or risk. The thing that always comes to mind, you know, are pyramid. The people at the top are getting rich while the people at the bottom are working. For instance, then, uh, for as another example, we could consider an individual who consistently invests in various guaranteed high return investment programs without thoroughly researching or understanding then those risks that are involved in there. And they might be drawn to these schemes because they promise a quick wealth through methods like cryptocurrency trading, uh, pyramid schemes, or unverified investment opportunities, all the while overlooking the importance, importance of due diligence and sustainable financial planning. So this type of person often seeks shortcuts to financial successes, believing they can achieve significant wealth without the patience, discipline, and or efforts required for more traditional and substantial and sustainable financial strategies. And unfortunately, when we get into such get-rich get schemes, they're often associated with a higher risk of financial loss. Another, another example of a fantasy chaser might be this. A chaser of fantasies might be an unrealistic entrepreneur. When we look at an example of an unrealistic entrepreneur, it might be someone who starts multiple business ventures without realistic assessments of market demand, proper planning, or a solid business strategy. For instance, imagine an individual who, without conducting a thorough market research, decides to launch several businesses simultaneously in industries they have little knowledge of. They have been attracted to the idea of being an entre entrepreneur, but lack a clear understanding of the challenges and requirements of running a successful business. This unrealistic entrepreneur might invest significant resources without a viable business plan, expecting a quick and substantial return. Their venture may lack sustain, sustainable business. Their adventure may lack a sustainable business model, um, leading to financial strain and then eventual, eventually the failure of the business. Now. This example highlights the importance of what? Of realistic planning, market understanding, and a solid foundation of entrepreneurial successes. Number four, 
the fantasy career pursuer. Now, what would, that, what would be a good example of a fantasy career pursuer? Well, it could be someone who frequently changes career paths based on idealized notions without considering practical factors such as skills, qualifications, or even market demands. For instance, imagine an individual who every few months decides to pursue a new career solely because it seems glamorous or is associated with a particular lifestyle that they, that they admire. This person then may switch from aspiring to be maybe a famous actor to wanting to become a high-profile chef without gaining the necessary training or experience in either field. Maybe they want to become a pilot without taking flying lessons. But the fantasy career pursuer may not take the time to assess their own strengths, interests, or actual demands of the professions that they wish to pursue. And as a result, they may find themselves repeatedly changing directions without building a solid foundation in any particular career, potentially leading then to a lack of professional fulfillment and stability. Number five, a romantic idealist. An example maybe of an, I, 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 a romantic idealist could be someone who cons consistently pursues romantic relationships based on unrealistic ideals or fantasies without considering then the practical compatibility or the complexities of real life relationships. For instance, consider an individual who is drawn to the idea of a fairy tale romance and then expects their partner to perfectly embody a set of idealized qualities. Hmm, sounds like every man before marriage, doesn't it? This person might prioritize superficial characteristics on romantic gestures over the fundamental aspects of compatibility or emotional connection. The romantic idealist may have unreal ex unrealistic expectations about relationships, believing that love should follow a script akin to the movies, or even in the, the books and the novels in which they read. And this approach then may lead to disappointment, and not may lead, it's going to lead to disappointment and difficulties in maintaining meaningful, lasting relationships as well as life, as well as life dynamics, often that involved um, the complexities that go beyond idealized fantasies. Then we have the inconsistent goal sitter. An example of an inconsistent goal setter might be someone who frequently sets goals but fails to follow through with consistent and meaningful actions to achieve them. Now, here are a few more scenarios illustrating this particular type of behavior of an inconsistent goal setter. How about a fitness enthusiast? An individual who sets ambitious goals and fitness goals, such as going to the gym regularly or running certain distances, but inconsistently follows through, often skipping workouts or abandoning, abandoning their fitness routine. Number two, career aspirant, a career aspirant. Some, in other words, it'd be someone who aspires to advance in their career by setting goals for professional development professional development, but lacks consistency in pursuing additional skills, attending relevant workshops, or actively seeking new opportunities. Another form maybe of an inconsistent goal setter might be an academic pursuer, a, stu a student who sets goals for academic achievement, such as maintaining a, a high GPA, or completing a certain number of research projects, but inconsistently puts in the effort needed to sustain this academic success. So, moving on then to fantasy chasers. What would be another example of a fantasy chaser, an individual who chases fantasies? What might be an individual who 
has what we would call a fantasy lifestyle. They're, they become a fantasy lifestyle seeker. And maybe an example of a fantasy lifestyle seeker could be someone who consistently pursues an extravagant or unrealistic lifestyle without acknowledging financial constraints or the need for careful planning. Here's several scenarios illustrating this behavior. We might have the luxury aficionado. And it's, a, you know, imagine then an individual who cons consistently aspires to live a luxurious lifestyle filled with high-end fashions, exotic vacations, and extravagant experiences. This person may constantly spend well beyond their means, accumulating debt to maintain this appearance of opulence. The fantasy lifestyle seeker might highlight immediate gratification and the perception of wealth over long-term financial stability. And they may be drawn to the idea of a lavish lifestyle as seen in, in media, media and social media platforms or celebrity cultures without considering the financial responsibilities and consequences associated with sustaining such a lifestyle. This behavior could lead to financial strain, debt, accumulation, and a mismatch between the desired lifestyle and their actual financial capacity. And the key characteristic is an ongoing pursuit of a lifestyle that's not really realistically attainable based upon their income and their financial resources. So in essence, a person chasing fantasies often fails to ground their aspirations in reality leading to unfulfilled dreams, and as suggested in this biblical verse that we've just read, ends up in poverty. Now, when we come back to Proverbs 29, 28, verse 29, a hard worker has plenty of food, but a person who chases fantasies ends up in poverty. So when we compare this to the hard worker as defined in the scripture, a hard worker is an individual who consistently puts forth substantial effort, dedication, and diligence in their, hard, in their task and responsibility. This person then is characterized by a strong work ethic, demonstrating a commitment to achieving goals, meeting deadlines, and producing high-quality results. Hard workers often display perseverance, resilience, and a willingness to go above and beyond what is required. This type of person understands the value of a consistent effort and takes pride in their work, contributing positively to their personal and professional endeavors. Hard workers are typically motivated, disciplined, and reliable contributors in various aspects of their life, be it in the workplace, the academic settings, or even in personal pursuits. Some common traits of hard workers are diligence would be number one. Hard workers demonstrate a consistent and focused effort in their task, paying attention to detail and taking care to produce high quality results. Another trait would be reliability. They are dependable and can, can be accounted and can be counted on to fulfill their responsibilities and to meet deadlines and follow through on commitments. Another trait, number three, would be motivation. Hard workers are in, in intrinsically in motivated to achieve their goals, whether in their career, whether in their academics, or personal pursuits, they have a strong internal drive that propels them forward. Number four would be persistence. They exhibit resilience in the face of challenges, not easily discouraged by setbacks. Instead, hard workers per persevere and find solutions to overcome obstacles. Number five would be time management. Efficient use of time is a common trait as hard workers then prioritize 
their tasks, they set goals, and organize their schedules effectively to maximize productivity. Number six, a hard worker shows initiative. They take the initiative to identify and tackle tasks without constant supervision, actively seeking ways to contribute and improve their work environment. Number seven, a hard worker is adaptable. And so hard workers are adaptable and open to learning. They embrace change, continually seek improvement, and are willing to acquire new skills to enhance their performance. Number eight, maintaining a positive and optimistic mindset contributes to resilience. It fosters teamwork and enables hard workers to face challenges with a constructive outlook. The ninth trait would be hard workers are team players. Whether in a professional or personal setting, hard workers collaborate well with others, contributing positively to group dynamics and achieving collective goals. And the last and final trait that we want to look at is commitment to ex excellence. Hard workers strive for excellence in their work. They have a strong sense of pride in what they do and aim the for the highest standards possible in their life. These traits collectively then contribute to the reputation of an individual as a hard worker, demonstrating their commitment to success and personal growth. So then we could say then a hard worker is characterized by what? By a consistent effort, reliability, and a commitment to realistic goals, which then will lead to prosperity. Their, their diligence, perseverance, contribute to success in various endeavor, endeavors that they're involved in. And on the other hand, the chaser of fantasies pursues impractical or unrealistic goals without the necessary dedication to meaningful actions. And this tendency then can lead to what? Poverty. Why? Due to a lack of practicality, discipline, and failure to address the real world challenges. The hard workers focus on tangible achievements and sustained efforts fosters prosperity. While the chaser of fantasies may neglect practicalities, thus contributing to their adverse outcomes and financial difficulties. That's why when we come back to Proverbs chapter 28, verses 27, whoever gives to the poor will lack nothing, but those who close their eyes to poverty will be cursed. According to this verse, those who give to the poor will not suffer lack. This verse suggests that being generous and providing for those in need will lead to a state of abundance and sufficiency. It also implies that those who ignore or close their eyes to poverty will face negative consequences and be cursed. The emphasis then of this particular scripture is on the positive outcomes of generosity and the potential negative consequences of neglecting the needs to the poor. And that's where we'll end tonight. So this evening... What we looked at was one of the pathways to prosperity is to be a hard worker and not fall into the pitfalls of fantasies. And then if we'll give to the poor, we'll not suffer lack. Amen? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that the interest of your word has given and brought life tonight. Holy Spirit, I just ask you to take the words that, that have been spoken and for each person that there's pieces within the message that, that, that just come to life in their heart. Father, we just thank you for the word of God is alive and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. And Father, I pray that this evening, if there be anyone within the sound of my voice that has never accepted your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would do so tonight.
in Jesus' name, that the Holy Spirit would convict them of their need of the Savior. We thank you for that. If you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, man, I just want to give you that opportunity real quick. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, that if we'll confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, we will be born again. We will be saved. That Greek word saved means to be made whole. It just gives implication that without Jesus, we are incomplete. If you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and you would like to make heaven your home tonight, then just pray this simple prayer with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, forgive me of all my sins. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart, become Lord of my life. I confess with my mouth what I now believe in my heart, that you were raised from the dead. And from this moment forward, I'm born again. I'm on my way to heaven. Man, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time, I want to take this opportunity to welcome you into the kingdom of God. Something miraculous and wonderful is happening to you right now. You may not understand it, but it's okay. That's Jesus coming into your life. I encourage you to do two things. Number one, we, we encourage you to get into a good Bible-believing church. If you're here in the city, we believe His Grace Church is such a place. We are a smaller community of believers, and... Um, where everybody can know your name. Come be a part of what we're doing. We're reaching the nations with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Come be a part of His Grace Church. Grow and develop with us. And uh, I also encourage you to check out our website at www.hgc.church forward slash resources. When you get there, there is a video series in there called The New Birth. It just gives you a... Uh, Executive level synopsis, very short. Pastor Kim and I taught it. There's 10 videos, I think, in there, about five to seven minutes long, just to kind of give you a quick synopsis of exactly what's happening to you right now as Jesus come into your heart. So I also want to encourage you to be a part of our Sunday morning worship celebration. This week we have Jim Harris in the house, and uh, it's going to be a great time uh, with the Holy Ghost, and I'm believing he's got a great message for us. So come be a part of our Sunday morning worship celebration beginning at 1030 Central Standard Time right here in San Antonio. We're conveniently located in the far west part of San Antonio, right off of 151 and 410 inside Calabria Road. If you're not quite sure where that's at, check out our website at www.hgc.church forward slash locations for an interactive map. Hallelujah. So 1030 Sunday morning. We're going to kick up the jams. We're going to rock the house for Jesus. And then I also invite you to check out our social media platforms of Rumble, Twitter, which is now X, our YouTube channel, and our Facebook uh, page as well because we, we're posting um, we're posting material out there throughout the week to help you encourage you to grow and develop spiritually so amen pastor kim and i believe that god has something unique to say to you this week and our hope is that you feel his love stronger today than ever before i'm pastor michael pilmore this is his grace church a destination for divine visitation where miracles are still happening today thanks for taking the opportunity to be a part of our program and our service this evening god bless you